There is a legend that recounts the return of Jesus to glory after his time on earth. Even in heaven, he bore the marks of his earthly pilgrimage with its cruel cross and shameful death. The angel Gabriel approached him and said, Master, you must have suffered terribly for men down there. Jesus replied that he did. Gabriel continued, And do they know and appreciate how much you love them and what you did for them? Jesus replied, Oh no, not yet. Right now, only a handful of people in Palestine know. Gabriel was perplexed. He asked, then what have you done to let everyone know about your love for them? Jesus said, I've asked Peter, James, John, and a few other friends to tell others about me. In turn, those who are told will tell others. My story will be spread to the farthest reaches of the globe. Ultimately, all of mankind will have heard about my life and what I have done. Gabriel frowned and looked rather skeptical. He knew what poor stuff men are made of. He said, yes, but what if Peter and James and John grow weary? What if people who come after them forget? What if, way down in the 21st century, people just don't tell others about you? Haven't you made any other plans? And Jesus answered, I have not made any other plans. I'm counting on them. 21 centuries later, he still has no other plan. He's counting on you and me. Christ counted on the early disciples and they delivered. Have we done as well? Today's scripture is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 and continuing through chapter 4, verse 5. We find this passage an urgent request to do the work of an evangelist and to fulfill our ministry. Hear now the reading of God's word. But as for you, con continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you... Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We take many of things in life for granted. Many of us grew up in Christian homes where God and church were part of everyday life. The scripture for today points to the treasure of the teachings of our family that are so often so much a part of us that we fail to appreciate them. I was well into my adult years before I came to appreciate the love and patience shown by my older sister when I was growing up. Every night before turning out the light, I would go lay on her bed and she would read to me from the golden treasury of Bible stories. She helped me gain a love of the Bible, and she taught me the importance of spending time in God's Word on a daily basis. What I learned in those years will remain with me all of my life. Paul reminds Timothy of the teaching and guidance received in his childhood. He urges Timothy to hold fast to these teachings of those who nurtured him in the faith. Paul reminds him that through 
the scripture, God provides education and training. This is as relevant today as it was in Timothy's day. And it's important for everyone, clergy and layperson alike. God gives us the equipment to be in ministry. And notice I said in ministry, not in the ministry. We sometimes think of ministry as reserved for those ordained to full-time pastoral service. When I was at Oak Grove, the bulletin listed those who led in the church. There was the pastor, the choir director, the instrumentalist, and then listed as ministers, it was the congregation. We are all called to full-time service, not as pastors of a church, but as disciples of Christ. But seeing this in the bulletin every week is a lot, a lot like the teachings of our childhood. We see it so often and it gets so familiar and so comfortable, I'm afraid we don't pay much attention to it anymore. Too often we expect our pastors to serve us as we sit back and do nothing. I used to play softball and I officiated softball, volleyball and basketball for about 20 years. And I think every player I ever met wanted to be a part of the competition. They joined the team to, to play. They didn't want to sit on the bench. They wanted to participate. We chuckle at the saying, funny, isn't it? How some churchgoers sing standing on the promises when all they do is sit on the premises. But unfortunately, that so many times is true. Now don't get me wrong, we do a lot of good in the world. We feed the hungry, we clothe the naked, we assist the devastated, we give money to the unfortunate. So why have we not made more of an impact in the world around us? Have we gotten so involved in church work that we've forgotten what the work of the church is? Perhaps the reason we have not made more of an impact in the world is that we have forgotten that the world's greatest need is the spiritual. What is it that keeps us from meeting people's spiritual needs? The fear of failure? Of maybe feeling that we're not adequate for the task? Is it the fear of a rejection or embarrassment? The fear of not fitting in? Or maybe we're just afraid of getting involved. Or have we just become so comfortable, so wrapped up in ourselves that we simply don't care if anyone else knows about God and God's grace? Jesus did not insulate himself from the pain and suffering of the world, and neither should we. When we love others, serve others, and strive to be all that God has called us to be, we may get dirty, we may get hurt, we probably will get used, but God calls us to give ourselves to his service just the same. A few years back at annual conference on Thursday morning, the sermon was entitled, Can One Be a, Dis a Christian and Not Be a Disciple? And the answer is no. A disciple follows the teachings, principles, and example of the person to whom they are attached. When we call ourselves Christian, we are telling the world that we have attached ourselves to Christ and are following his example, that we are his disciples. But discipleship takes work. There comes with the attachment a commitment and a responsibility. If you decided to run a marathon, you wouldn't just show up the day of the competition. You would get out and start running, maybe a mile at first and then work your way up to five miles until you finally got up to where you could run 26 miles in one day. And that might take years. If you want to play the piano or any other musical instrument, you don't just pick it up or sit down at the piano and immediately start playing a classical piece of music. You would take lessons. You would learn scales. You would practice, practice, 
practice. Again, for years before you would really reach any level of great competence. And if you've ever played a sport, you know that you practice days on end to become a better team. You don't just show up on game day and expect to win because you've not practiced with your teammates. We as United Methodists are charged by the Book of Discipline under the General Rule of Discipleship, paragraph 118, 1118.2a, to witness to Jesus Christ in the world and to follow his teachings through acts of compassion, justice, worship, and devotion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It takes someone like Paul to remind us that we are disciples and we are to serve with the gifts that we have received from God. We have at our disposal tools for teaching, correction, and training. And these tools, of course, are found in the Bible. The Bible speaks pointedly to us concerning what is wrong in our lives, but it also gives instruction on how it can be made right, and it gives us training for righteousness. The Word of God gives us in detail the things that go up to make a godly life. Verse 17 tells us that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What would happen if you only ate an occasional meal? You would probably die, wouldn't you? Or at least be severely malnourished. How many people are spiritually malnourished or even spiritually dead because they fail to feed on the Word of God? I read somewhere that the average time people spend reading the Bible and praying is only 10 minutes per day. That's average time. Could it be that we're so busy that we've not taken the time to study God's word, to know what we're supposed to be doing? How much time do we spend learning what is expected of us and preparing for the task? When I was a freshman in high school, I took a typing class. We were given an assignment early one term and we had an entire six weeks to get that assignment completed. I had plenty of time, so I played around, and I did not apply myself to the task at hand. And when the time came, I did not have my assignment completed, and I received an F for that six weeks. The shame I felt having to face my teacher was bad enough, but when I had to face my parents, well, Fortunately, I had another chance because my final grade wasn't based solely on that six weeks performance, but on the grades I had made during the entire year. Je Paul reminds Timothy that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead, and that someday his works will be judged, or graded, by none other than Jesus himself. Guess what? So will we. What will our report card look like when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Well, we have to stand before him as I did my teacher and my parents and say, I've just fooled around and I have not done the work that I've been called to do. Or we'll be, be able to stand before Jesus and say, I've read, I've studied, I've tried to do your will to the best of my ability. If so, then we will hear him say, well done. We need to do everything in our ability in such a way that we can offer it to Christ. Our service should be that it would demonstrate to the world that we are disciples of Jesus. We need to be bold, knowing that God is with us each step of the way. And notice in verse 2 of chapter 4, it says, in season and out of season. The Common English Bible translates it this way. Be ready to do it whether it is convenient or inconvenient. I found out a long time ago that God really likes to get you out of your comfort zone. But the greatest blessings I've ever received in my Christian walk came when I finally said yes 
to the task God was calling me to. And notice I said finally. Sometimes God had to work on me quite a while before I got to that yes. But God never gave up. And neither should we. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Make an effort to present yourself to God as a tried and true worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, but one who interprets the message of truth correctly. I like the way the Living Bible paraphrases it. Work hard so God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what his word says and means. Know, as defined in Webster's Dictionary, means to understand clearly and with certainty. To understand from experience. To have fixed in the mind or memory. The only way we can know God's word is by spending time there on a regular basis. God's word makes us adequate, equipping us to do his work. We need to study his work in order to make ourselves useful to God and to those around us. When I first sat down at that typewriter, I found that the keys on it were blank. There were no letters or numbers on it. I had to depend on my teacher to guide me through the learning process and internalize the pattern of the keys. And we were only taught a couple of keys at a time until we were able to utilize the entire keyboard. It's the same with our Bibles. God reveals to us as we are able to absorb the knowledge. But it is our responsibility to study, to listen, to know and live his word daily. When we as God's people respond in obedience to his word, he is ready to bless us and accomplish great things through us. The mission goal for the United Methodist Church is follow Christ, make disciples, transform the world. How can we make more of an impact on the world? The answer begins with the first challenge, follow Christ. That is accomplished when we are more faithful in studying his word and spending time talking to him in prayer, asking him to reveal to us ways that we can be of greater service to him. Then make disciples. Just before Jesus' ascension, he charged his followers to be, to wit be witnesses and to make disciples to the ends of the earth. We are God's vessels, and our task is to allow ourselves to be filled up and then poured out for the world. God gives us what we need to make disciples and then transform the world through his love and his grace. I'd like to close with the last verse of today's text as paraphrased in the Living Bible. This is a challenge for each of us as we go about our daily lives. Stand steady and don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Bring others to Christ. Leave nothing undone that you ought to do. Christ counted on the early disciples and they delivered. Today, Christ is counting on me. Christ is counting on you.